the novel. I've been copywriting for 100 years, 100,000 headlines can't be that difficult. So um, I published during COVID, which is the only thing I know because I've never published before. So I published into the literal black hole. Had, we, had a, we had a private launch, we ate and drank and were merry, and then the book went into exclusive books and recommended reads in December, but it was, it was literally kind of like, a, a, not a black hole, but it, it didn't have the traction that maybe it could have had had people been able to go into stores, um, how book sales went and stuff like that. So having been in advertising and having an imagination that has gone sort of beyond the book, I started to work my social network feed and my personal feed and my friends and people from the industry. So I kept it going. I kept it. And Helen, my publicist, shout out to Helen. A lot of people have told me that a book gets launched for two weeks, you get a publicist for two weeks, it goes out, it sells out, <laughs> And, the, and it's over. And in fact, authors have been contacting me and are saying, how, well, how are you doing this? Why are you doing this? And because I don't really know any better, and because COVID has changed everything, I'm using the digital realm and the real realm if I can to continue to amplify the book. So this isn't a launch, but it is the first in-person public space that we've been in for the last year and three months. Exactly. Mm -hmm. But with your help, so, so with, with, with the help of a publicist, a social media strategist, learning at my old age how the internet works, how amplification works, working Twitter, um, working, making new friends. I've, I've met so many people through, through the social media who I've met in person. Um, so, and I think that, that I think it's a very slow burn. I think that it's a marathon, not a sprint, because I'm very impatient. You know, advertising is brief to broadcast in a few weeks. Um, but since it's been now six and a half months. Um, we're continuing to continuing to pitch to overseas co-publishers. Um, I'm working on an audio book um, with my fairy godfather notes from my fairy godfather Stephen Fry. Um, and so it, it will be it will continue because the book isn't really time based because it's over two thousand years of history. Kind of the history's already happened, and the last chapter in my book is actually set February twenty twenty. Um, a little bit of background to, to your relationship with Stephen Fry. Um, I wrote this book, just to back up a little before we get to Stephen, I wrote this book for an MA, Master of Arts, at the University of Rodgersland, which Jill also did. And when I finished that, it wasn't really a novel, it was an exploration of the picaresque form, which is a um, pre-novel form that actually came of age in the Spanish Golden Ages. It was written, as my research went, by Converso Jews, Don Quixote. We, we think was written by, we, we think that, that there were a lot of men in particular, because it was only men then, who converted to whatever the religion of the day was and then practiced their Judaism in secret. I might even be the opposite of that because I was raised a very secular way. I'm not religious at all, but I was in a Jewish marriage and I was in a Jewish base. It was, you know, I knew what it was like, I knew what anti-Semitism was like from the age of six. And when it was ready and when COVID had just destroyed everything, I wrote to him. I, I had a contact. I wrote to him. I spent six weeks on this email to not gush, to not gush, to not fangirl, to just speak to him as author to author. I would like, I'd like you to read the book. It was pretty much all I asked him. He came back with a blurb and said, darling, finish it, cannibalize it, do what you like with it, which I have. And I have, we've kept in contact. We have a personal relationship now, which I don't have to share. Uh, so I've, I've been very gracious about it, but and, and he is he's the most mentiest human being I've ever met in my life, of all of the people I've ever met in publishing. And he's left me to it. There's no more, there's no speaking to agents or sending it to publishers. There's a, there's a relationship that we're building, which one day when I go to England, I, I'm saving Stephen up for the British launch. Otherwise, he would be here this week. <laughs> <laughs> Put it that way. It's, it's a great endorsement. And I, I do encourage all writers, have their chutzpah to send it. If you get a rejection, it's all, it's all about rejection. This took me six years to write. Oh, exactly. Excluding. There are, many, there are many authors who have been rejected and then turned out to be bestsellers, mm. selling multi-million mm. copies of their books. Mm. So we just need to, we need to persist. But I think what, what is happening with Wanda is she is, she is out in the public space. Um, we are very, very, very fortunate that um, there are two big events still coming up for 
for Wanda, and one is at the Queensland Book Festival, which is going to be an online um, festival this year, 29th of May. 29th of May. And Lynn has got the most fantastic panel. Um, so please, please have a look. I mean, I think it's going to be a really, really good discussion with Sunday Times Books editor, Jennifer Platt, mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. Suniati, Suniati, the family of book family affair, and then Natasha, Oma Kadodi and Karan Banda. I'm saying it wrong. She's got three surnames. I was Yansi 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 from Rensburg, but I dropped it. Yes. Um, and so, and, and in fact, the theme of that is is the Maya Angelou quote that says something to the effect of "There's nothing more, there's nothing more awful than having an untold story within." You something to that effect, I can't remember the exact quote. So it's what, what's wonderful about it is a Zambian author, a Zimbabwean author and me, and, and, and a common thread that actually threads through it, which is, oh, why did you need to tell the story? So that's that's very exciting, and you must be excited about that. I, I am, and I'm now reading for pleasure again, which is an enormous thing. So I'm reading Sue's book, I'm read, I've read Natasha's book, so that, and there are such similar threads that go throughout it because all three of us, in a way, are outsiders inside our own culture and inside the world. And I think it's, you know, a woman's place is in the world, but where exactly do we fit in? Does it really matter? It's just your own thing. So I'm very excited, and thank you for that. And then, of course, you know, the other exciting news, and we we really, really thrilled about it, is the long listing of Wanda wow. on the Sunday Times Literary Awards for this year. So. I mean, that's just another enormous accolade for Lynn and for Wanda. And she I hide behind her. It's, it's, a, it's, very, sorry, it's very interesting having a character I can advertise Wanda up the kazoo. But me, even though Miller P is on today, it's, it, there's, there's, it's almost, it's so vulnerable to put yourself out there as a name, which you have to do, but Wanda is the name. You know, people have said to me, I've, I mean, I've put her in the arms of Mona Lisa. If, if you follow my Facebook page, I've, I've, I've inserted her into history. Elvis read it yesterday. David Bowie read it last <laughs> week. And, and people are saying, you know, what will happen if the Louvre comes and says, take Wanda out of Mona Lisa's hands? Really, when the Louvre comes, we'll worry about it. <laughs> uh, we'll apologize later. So, and because this is the image, this is the image that is, inspired me after a year. I found this image of the gypsy girl which is a Gazantian Turkish second century mosaic. And when I found her, I wanted to change the book's name to the Gypsy Girl Mosaic, but it was too, <coughs> it just didn't fit. But this is, the, this is the character, and if you look at the, we'll, we'll cut it in afterwards, Steve. When you actually look at her face, she hasn't got a mouth. And so I wanted to give Wanda a voice. And, and once the character took over me, because that kind of is what happens, she could say what she wanted to, as a Jewish female time traveling through history with a bit of sexual charge and a bit of musical sus. So we were actually, it was, it, it was a very fortuitous, and I think when one writes, you know, your, your, your destiny comes to you a little bit. And so this is Wanda, and she's out there. I'm just sitting in my isolated room with my dogs and my new book. So now tell me, while we're discussing the image of Wanda on the cover, um, I want to know what process, and did you choose the name, the name Wanda? Did this affect her changing her identity? You know that there's no, in Hebrew, the W is a V. And in fact, my husband calls her Wanda. And in the Chinese chapter, she's Wanda. <laughs> and in the Russian chapter, she's Wanda Rovska Lazorovska. So she, it was a very, she was always Wanda when I found her. And her original surname was Lastolovsky, which was just too obvious in Twee. Then I read about a few things. Lazarillo de Tormes was a, was a Picara book, which started the whole Picara kind of art form. And then of course the story of Lazarus in the Bible. And then when I changed my, it was originally going to be memoir. And I had my Me Too moment in a synagogue when I was 15, and I'd written this line, he had me in the shadow of the temple, which was Temple Shalom, I knew both had me. And then I thought, what if the temple was the temple? What if I re-engineer this character to 33 AD and tell the same story, but instead of a, a, a combi, it was a camel cart. And instead of him being the name that I will never say, there was a sort of revenge on it, 
but then I changed the story because instead of being assaulted, she fought back. So I, I rear engineered, and then I thought, why don't I just make her Lazarus' sister? So in actual fact, she is the sister of Lazarus in the Bible. She had two sisters, Martha and Mary. I don't know, I don't know any Jewish girls called Mary, I know a few, but I don't know where they got Mary from. So Mary, so Mary is her name, which is Miriam, but she doesn't like her name because everyone in my family has changed their names. Nobody likes their names. So when I when it became Wonder, then it was the wandering Jew, it was the wandering perception, and she just there's something weird that goes on, and I think with, with all writers, when you finally find your kind of thread, that she sometimes she wrote it. Like someone asked me, why is there so much sex in the book? I don't know. <laughs> she wanted, you know, when when at some point I had her in in the MA period, I had her being assaulted by a bunch of men, and everyone said, no, no, she can't, she can't, she can't be assaulted. Um, so so there was almost like a, a wonder who is kind of an exaggerated version maybe of myself, but it's where the where the creative spirit moved me to. So one and the B stands for but, which is daughter of, and I just like that she had a name, Wonder E. Lazarus. The original name for the book was No Madness, which was a portmanteau before Nomad Land of Nomad and Madness. And we, we, when my editor Alison Lowry, my divine editor, thought it was just a little bit too complicated, so it's a very nice name, except for the fact it goes into the religion section. So she 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 references the past of the picaresque, and she references her own surname, which is Lazarus, which is she who rose from the dead, because as you may know, she spoiler alert, she dies at the end of each chapter. So she reincarnates, which is also exploring the eternal return. There's a lot of philosophical and mythical aspects to it, but you can also just read it as a romping story. I mean, I know that Wanda dies at the end of every chapter, but does she actually live forever? I don't know yet. <laughs> um, there, there's, so I must maybe just tell you a little bit about the Wandering Jew myth. The Wandering Jew myth was created by monks in the Middle Ages to justify the prejudice of the scapegoat that had existed long before, and it was in the Bible sort of very underhandedly. On his way down the Via della Rosa, who he asked for a drink of water from, and the person said it was Cartophilus, they don't remember what it was. It was very brief, and, and the person said no. So in other words, Jesus thirsted, and this Jew said no. So I've included that in my tale, where, in fact, Yossi, as I call him, it's not really based on me, Yossi, Rob Yossi is being um, whipped with 39 lashes and Wanda comes and tends to his wounds with this nard, this sort of super sort of herb that she's got. And while he's lying there, he says to her, I, I might read it for you, I thirst. And she says, you can't drink it, it's poisoned. And he says, I, I will tarry, but you will go on. And that's the biblical quote. And so according to history, the wandering Jew was cursed with immortality by Christ himself. I'm, I'm not a Christian, I'm a sort of wayward Jew, but I found it very interesting that the middle Age guys went all the way back to the Bible to find a justification for how the Jews killed Christ, poisoned the wells, ate Christian babies on the matzah. They, they, I've been accused of a few of those. I don't do the babies on the matzah anymore because I'm more vegetarian these days. <laughs> but there, there, is a, there, is a, there was a sense of which my own culture had gone back so far and had been re engineered by so many parts of history that I really wanted to get Wanda's opinion, Wanda's take on the fact that wherever she went through history, this anti-Semitic, anti-female, anti-independent woman spirit came up. So the answer is, you'll have to read the book to see what happens because the difference between a picaresque novel and a novel, picaresque and a novel, is that in a picaresque, because I've, I've channeled that form, it's a low life individual who never grows through their experience. If you actually look at any hero's journey that involves the, the picaresque, they don't transcend. And because I tried to, or tried, attempted to change the picaresque into a novel, she had to transcend. So I had to save that moment for the end of the book. So when you see it, of course she lives forever. Yes, in a very short answer she does, but she might have an interquill, she might have a prequel, she might have a postquill. I've been advised not to do that yet when, when I write again, but Wanda keeps coming into my writing and it, it, I don't know if it's her or me. What was your approach to the many research and, and, and fiction writing. I mean, how much did you background accuracy in um, history? When I was writing, I didn't care much. When I was actually doing creative writing, you know, edit, what's it, edit, drug, 
no, right from the edit, so, so I just did it. Then I went and checked my sources, and then sometimes I find other sources from their sources. When it came to, because there's so many names to write in the book, when it came to the almost post-editing, I'll give you an example. There's a, there's a chapter with Mendelssohn, where, you know, Mendelssohn wrote the wedding march, and so did Wagner write in the wedding march, and there was a little interaction between two dandies on a deck d deciding which wedding march was the better. When I went back to check it, the, the wedding march of Wagner was written after my chapter history, because I had to decide on a moment in time, so I had to remove it. Um, when I did the first chapter and I talked about the pa Passover symbols, um, there was a roasted egg. I went and looked that up. A roasted egg only happened after the destruction of the Second Temple. Now, nobody knows this, but I couldn't put a roasted egg in there because it was 33 AD and the destruction only happened 70 years later. So I kind of, rear I think they call it fact-checking, which I did by myself with my editor as well, sometimes like, but the anachronism, so she speaks in a Yiddish kind of patois, which is her way of speaking. Now, obviously, there was no Yiddish 2,000 years ago. So there's a lot of, the way she speaks and acts is anachronistically almost universal, but the, the facts of the matter were, were, I did a lot of research internet, then I went to the library to check it properly. Um, so it's a, thank God for the internet, because I would have had to go and live in the Wilton Wally Library forever. So it's as accurate as it's possible to be. I'd like the historian to laugh. I don't want the historian to say, oh, well, you know, there, there were, I mean, two exactly. eggs on the plate. Exactly. So I, 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 so there was an academic side to this, but the creative side had to take precedence because that can, it's with almost the scientist and the magician have to work. I've been following Hadassah's pomegranate path all over the known world. We would never have wound up in Bethany. Lazzie would still be alive, and I'd be mortal. But that's not how the Hamantaschen crumbled. A painted lady flaps her wings and all that jazz. The disciples remember it differently, but they were always going to write their own version anyway. I was there. I saw it all. Not in my present incarnation, but who am I to split shape or his? The bait sim started to roll when Rob Yossi and his cleverers were invited over for that last supper. It was a double whammy, actually. Pesach and Shabbos rolled into one. Martha and I were helping Hadassah boil and bake the exodus of matzah balls. I was never much one for domestic activity, and did all I could to wheedle out of the chores in the wide, clay-baked kitchen. Normally, the servants would clean up after us. But on Pesach, Hadassah was having no show for them. Scour the scullery, polish the corslet. On your hands and knees, girl chicks. Seek and destroy any vestige of hummus. No meat, no rice, no leftover showbread. It all had to go. On Pesach, we're forbidden to put anything in our mouths that rises. And then there's the matter of changing the dishes. One said Milchadik, another Fleshadik. Hadassah was very proud of her Pesach crockery, handed down through the maternal line since the great trek back from Babylonia. Each item adorned with a symbol of the festival, a dandelion, a sprig of parsley, chopped up haroset representing the bricks and mortar of the slaves, kosher herb, salt water for tears, all in all, a huge schlep. Lazzy didn't have to do kitchen duties. He was practicing his shofar in the courtyard with the chickens while Martha and I had our hands full. I could see him from the window, pursing his collected lips to the blowhole and wheezing a few breathy parts into the chafed afternoon air. He hadn't quite got the first lobby to Kia note right. Will you stop that racket? Ma moaned from beneath her migraine. Lazzy, let me show you how it works, I shouted from the scullery. You're a girl chick. You're not allowed to touch it, says who. I dropped my hammer's basket and ambled into the courtyard. It is written, he wheezed. The holy horn is forbidden for Megalus. Oh, for fix sake, Lazzy, give me a chance. I'll tell Zayda. It's going to be Trey if you touch it. Zayda doesn't have to know, I said. He's at the temple all week for Pesach. Now hand it over. I grabbed the horn from his protesting grasp and puckered up at the pointy end. Give it back, wheezed Laz, or I'm reporting you to the Sandy Bedmen. Sandy Headmen, I corrected him. You're the one with the cheder chops, schmeckle face. Lazzy snatched the shofar back and drew breath again. It sounded like the bubbles we sibs blew when we were trying to turn farty blame on each other at the Shabbos table. Then, Lazzy's rasping became more laboured. And suddenly he fell to the ground, teeth clenched, 
eyes rolled back to the whites. His body arched as if a great cord was pulling him up to heaven by his wishbone and then dashing him mercilessly back to earth. Martha, bring a spoon, I screamed at my sister. Milk or meat, Martha yelled back. This is no time to quibble. It doesn't matter. He's swallowing his tongue. Martha flung a Kneilach label, label through the open door. I wrestled it between my brother's gritted teeth. Ma, help, I yelled. Hadassah stood behind the kitchen curtain, immobile. Martha, bring the nard, I bellowed. I always had some muskroot handy for Lazzie's fits. Its roots, crushed to powder and dissolved in boiled water, calmed his convulsions and my own nerves. Too much was fatal, too little was ineffective. You had to get the dose just right. You gave it to the rogue, remember? Martha chided. You got the resin all over your hair. All right already, bring the ash for juice. It's in the Hamid's basket. It's not kosher and pesa. For fig's sake, Martha, get your tochas over here. Martha dashed into the courtyard, matzah meal and egg yolk coagulating between her fingers. She gingerly rolled up his simla and straddled in Lazzie's puny chest. I cradled his head, attempted to prise open his jaw, and received a couple of savage bites to the thumb. It took both of us to hold him to the ground, or he surely would have snapped himself in two. Maximil and blood began to bubble into the foamy paste at the corners of his mouth as he arched and arched again. Suddenly, he froze in mid-climax and slumped to the cobbles, lifeless, the ladle slack between his foamy jaws. Martha wept. Adassa stood like a statue at the window. I want us to talk. I want you to explain your shikshan theory. A shikshan theory. So, <coughs> I am of Semitic origin. I always knew that, but there, that was raised in Scotland and England and Australia, and I didn't have a, a sense of it until I came to live here, and then it was middle of a party. So, when I decided to write it with the vernacular that I wanted, Yiddish was a perfect foil for the way she speaks. So it wasn't intended that she was going to have a Yiddish kind of thing, and it's very interesting because it makes a lot of people uncomfortable. Strangely enough, my Jewish guys, who were like, I don't understand what this means, and I don't know what it is, and I can't read it because it's so, we spoke about this months ago. It doesn't really matter. If you're going to read Clockwork Orange by Anthony Burgess, he's made up a whole language out of Russian. So, I, so, so, I mean, there are lots of words that people won't understand because they're just weird words. So I decided for my, for, and the shiksa, so for those of you who don't know, the shiksa is usually a non-Jewish woman. Sometimes it's referred to the domestic in the kitchen like the shiksa. It's derogatory, it's a pejorative, but it's also quite fun. And so, for example, I do yoga and we talk about Adi Shakti, which is the three triple goddess, and Adi Shiksa is also a thing. So I'm also taking deeply religious, deeply flawed, patriarchal, cultural, um, what do you call them? Um, holy cows, literally holy cows, there's a holy hill, holy cow chapter, and, and sending it up. So it's not offending anyone except maybe my own people and maybe a few rabbis who really won't be happy. So a shiksunami, so I did a glossary for the ebook, which will come into the next print, hopefully, and then I started a shiksunary and I worked with my proofreader, looked up every single possible Yiddish word in the book. If you don't know what Shabbos, if you really don't know what Shabbos is, really don't read it. But it doesn't really matter. Because you don't know what um, Nando Gopala, the Krishna cowboy chick who has 16,100 milk mandalas, who are called the Gopi Chans, who all dance with him, but none of them can speak. So in every religion, you've got this kind of um, silenced voice of the female, silenced voice of the female. So the shiksunary, which I'm really doing mostly on social, is a little bit of a glossary for you to understand it so that it won't defeat you as you read. But li readers of literary fiction won't have the problem because there's always words you don't understand. So the shiksunary is out there, and there are words, words not understood, and which I think is quite, I mean, it's, it's really, I'm really sending myself up. If I can't send myself up, we can. Or send her up. She's sending me up, actually. It doesn't matter. So, yeah, it does, so it, there, are, there are words, and but, you know, if you're in 11 different chapters in history, there are 11 different, in fact, there were originally about 34 chapters, or fragments. And then I had to, I had to divide it over the 2,000 years so that we could go epoch by epoch. So I couldn't write something set in 1842 when Queen Victoria 
there was a, a, an assassination attempt in her life, for example. I found that very interesting. So I kind of wrote the story around that event. Um, and then there was the wig club where they where they made wigs out of women's pubic hair. They really did. There was a sacred wig. It was kept. I'll still maybe write that one, but I couldn't fit it in because the timing was too close. So moving it all, all over these 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 three thousand years, it's a challenging read, but it's funny. If it's not funny, put it down. If you're not laughing out loud, put it's it down. very funny. It must be funny because I've known Stephen for a long time. So I need to know. <laughs> Well, you know, listening to Lynn during the reading um, also brings me to the audiobook that is mm. in development at the moment. And I think, um, you know, I think there has been discussion about Lynn not being the narrator. But I think, I think Lynn's voice is absolutely Ooh. perfect. Ooh. We're going to cut that in. This is the interesting thing, and it's, it's not a, a, a diss on any publishers and probably you guys could tell me better, is I have a South African book with Mojaji, I adore Colleen, I'm <coughs> grateful, it's fantastic, but it's South Africa only. The international rights, our own claims will take time, but the sort of peasant wisdom is that if you get an international deal, then somebody international will do it, because they take it over, that who am I? You know, um, mm. is, is he Archibald would probably do it better than me, but I'm a South African, here I am, under COVID, I tried to do it myself during COVID. I, was, I live in the sound studio, kind of. And I was pressing the button, going around the back, doing my, and I mean, terrible equipment. So it took me about four months to record half an hour. And eventually I said to my life partner, husband, father of my dogs, can you help me? And he said, the only way I'm going to read this because if you read it to me. So I'm actually reading it. And, and Stephen Fry has said, think of it when you read it, that you're reading to one person, someone you admire. Someone who you could read to, and you must read slowly. I'm not going to do, so for example, in the Indian chapter, I can't do Indian accents anymore. I can't do black accents anymore. I can't do Chinese accents anymore, but there's a little bit of it. So it's a little bit of a piss take, but there's, there, there's so many characters from so many eras, and, and there's a lot of dialogue. So I'm doing it, and um, if it only goes local, fine. You know, I think that authors, I really do think, no, no shame on present company. But authors need to become, because it's an introvert act, authoring. You're in a dark room by yourself with food being passed under the door. When you become an author, when you're published, you've got to shine it somehow. And everyone's very shy and alone. You know, I don't want to say there's a, there's, a, there's a kind of, it's the introvert way not to publicize it. But now that I've got you, I can sort of channel my introvert through you so that you can say all the nice things. Um, but it's but that's why I'm saying it. There has to be there has to be the sort of ongoing. You have to kind of turn it around and pretend you didn't write it at all and treat it as a product. To be completely honest. How do you think Wanda chose you? Shit. What an interesting question. You know, there's a there's a lot of people. I've read a lot of authors that have said, you know, and then this this, this character just appeared in my head. It's interesting because I can't think back to a time that she didn't exist. And when I when I applied for the MA, which was how I got into the MA with 50 pages of prose, a lot of my writing is like this. It, there's always a sarcasm, there's always funny, there's always, and in fact, now that I'm writing the second novel for the PhD, I'm trying to keep her out of it, but I realize that she's me. So uh, one of the MA guys said, you, you misspelled novel on the cover. Because what it really is is a, is, is a from my own life, my own life experience, because I am aged and because I have a lot of life experience and I've done the full 60, which is when women come to maturity, I'm told, and then we need to tell our story because we're not raising babies and whatever else we were supposed to be doing, which I wasn't. So Wanda was a kind of a projection of my own life story through and because of the fiction, because of the imagination, I could bring in life experience with imagination to create something completely different. And, and therefore, if she found me psychological, she was always there, which is terribly scary. It's like having fertilized embryos in a fridge somewhere, you know, and those are my babies. So I, I don't know how many more fertilized eggs I've got. I think she'll always be there. And it's interesting because when I write again, I, I said, no wonder, no wonder, no wonder. And then I wrote a piece about Lilith, who was Adam's first yeah. wife, and there she was. Yeah. Me spurned? You're fucking kidding, you know. So, so there is, and I think that, in fact, I think it's uh, a lot of authors say it's 
every time you write a book, you're in a sense writing it. The same, the same premise kind of comes in. So I think of um, Kundera, for example. I've read all of his books. There's, he always comes back to the same issues. So if I want to, there's a concept Kolisha. I don't know if the German knew it. Kolisha means the, the voice of the woman. And then they append it. The voice of the woman is inappropriate. Aha! I can write you a few short stories on that. Because... My voice has always been an inappropriate voice, and now I have an actual conduit, and I can say she did. So it kind of is a, it's almost like a, it, it's a persona, and I suppose in psychological terms, it's a persona I've worn, and she is, now people say, how old is she? She's timeless, she's really timeless. But in my timelessness, I couldn't have written this at 30. My own life experience wasn't rich enough for me to pull on that now. But good question. Are we going to read the sexy bit from? chapter called the Sultana of Swing, which is um, Constantinople, 1555. One has just landed there again. She's met um, one of the cousins. She is tasked to find the Saz, which is a, all, all of the instruments throughout the whole book is a, some kind of string instrument. And she grows through that. She learns to sight read. She learns to actually read. Then she learns how to play properly. So she evolves. But here she is in chapter 7. Solly the Sultan lay sideways on the embroidered bedspread, slack belly glistening in the lamplight, varicose veins poulticed by the tight woolen stockings I had smuggled into the seraglio. Around us lay the detritus of lovemaking, discarded dildos, dribbled wineskins, the lap of luxury and fabulous disarray. Sol held the key to the kingdom between his legs, his harem, his forbidden city of clitties his pride and his shame combined. How did you do that? He puffed. Magical powers, I smiled. It's all the Christian babies we get to eat. Saul was a prem, but if you didn't know how to sing it just right while nibbling the big boy, you could rub him raw ten ways of Ramadan and relief would evade him. F was his scarlet letter. F for fellatio, his secret sin, in the key of F major. It took both Saz and Suck to give Saul his due. Unless they grasped this solid insight, the freshest female flesh would fail to rouse his scepter. If you've ever held a sultan by the short and curlies, you'll know the feeling. Emperors, presidents, rabbis, high priests, they're all seduced by the flattery of an intelligent woman playing them at their own power game. Tit for turban, so to speak. Things with Soddy were going to be no different. I wanted some of that salty sultan action, but my eye was on two prizes, to locate and repossess the original Saz, and see where our lollipop girls had been sucked in. After I'd given him a second blowjob through his quilted ropes, which took all of 12 seconds, a new record, Sonny lit a cherry hookah, rolled onto his back, and babbled away in Ladino about Roxolana, his wayward chief concubine. He told me how he had been smitten on sight by the slave girl for sale in the marketplace, a Polish beauty, not 15 years old, an utterly unravished bride and how she'd moistened her philtrum as he rode past atop his litter, and he'd instantly stiffened and asked for her, and they brought her to him, and he'd fallen into unfathomable longing, his soul on a glistening string of poisoned pearls. She told me I'm a terrible lover, the sultan said miserably. He rolled over for a slug from a wineskin, and one of his stockings snagged on a diamante rose. Shame, Sol. I unpicked the thread. How could she think such a thing? Every night after dinner, she downed two bottles of barley vodka before I could mount her. Her sleeping draught kicked in and she, she snored like the dead until dawn. Perhaps it helped her block out the morning mesmerings. She told me all my other paramours are lying. She couldn't possibly. When I could rouse her from her slumber, I like to ride her in perda position. You know, when she's on top and I'm on fire beneath. But my belly got in the way and I kept slipping out, and she would never let me use the ivory dildo I bought her in Baghdad. What can a despot do? I had to finish myself off in the antechamber with saucy miniatures, and it takes bloody ages. It's a lugubrious game, I muttered. I think we can stop there because this is the, the reason I want to say this to you as well. The sex is a piss take, the sex is ironic. The way that the male gaze has always worked, sorry to the men, but that it's always the luscious lips of the cherry calumnia. I'm using that, but I'm using it, you know, that worst sex scene ever. Um, I'm using, um, I won't give you another, so, so the, the sex is actually in a sense her agency, 
and the, the males can fit in or not fit in. There's no, I was taken in by his beautiful smile. In the beginning, she falls in love with Carter, but that gets done. So in the sense of it being a, a, a book that looks at sex differently, it's a, it's a very cynical older woman's projection into a younger woman of the way that sex works as, as, a, as a matter of agency, which is why all women are behind a veil and behind a clothes and behind a thing, because you're dangerous. Shall I just show and stone for you quickly? You didn't get that because you're only shooting from the waist up. <laughs> um, oh, oh I'll, I'll do my Sharon Stone again. So, so it's it's supposed to be funny, guys. It's it's it, it might insult some people. It might insult uh, women behind the veil. And in fact, I've given the book and sold the book to a few Islamic women who are trapped in Clark School, for example, behind the veil, and are in their fifties and are going, "What the fuck did I do with my life?" And I'm not trying to. So, if there's a message, I'm not trying to like start a revolution, but there is a way that a woman can be in the world, despite what the rabbis say. And I suppose that's in a way, I'd, I'd love, I'd, don't you want to turn into a sub into an orthodox rabbi, we can have that discussion. And now, gosh, I'll get my way to start. <laughs> start from the bottom and work your way up and start it. So it is, it's funny and it's a piss tape, and if the more you've read, the more you'll read into it, because there is, I, I come from a literary background, I did a BA when I was 12, I live with a, an encyclopedic culture vulture, um, and I always say to young people, you know, if you go to write, read a thousand books by the time you're 30. So, and, and I mean, you don't steal it, but I, but I am, I think the person I'm upset the most who's dead, who can't read this, is Kurt Vonnegut, strangely enough, who also had that sardonic, sarcastic attitude, but he, he didn't do women very well. So I, it would be a question of, did I do men do right? I've known a lot of men, and I've borrowed a lot. So, no names mentioned. Most of this is, Somebody asked me last time we spoke, have, have you been to a rooms? Have, have I lived in all these places? Well, I haven't actually been in, you know, 666 AD in a Chinese cave with a woman with a foot bind, foot, feet, foot spines, foot spines. Mm -hmm. But I have slept in a car in Canada when I was married to my little Jewish boy around the, 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 the spare tire and boot. I know what it's like to be in a very cold climate. So I haven't been to Russia, but I know how bloody cold it is. I haven't um, slept with Rasputin, but um, my husband then grew a beard post the fact, and so now I do sleep with Rasputin. So, you know, it could be predicted. <laughs> Didn't mean that, Helen. Shame. Not good enough. Right. I'll tell you this also. I have had the most support from the man I married to go in, because a lot of women think, you know, I can't do this and I can't shut off, and who's going to do the washing up, and even if we're both South African privileged women, to actually sit down and, and have the same concentration that a man would have, to be able to sit down and not be disturbed and write and take it seriously enough to take yourself seriously, or even as a piss take. So my husband has been the greatest support, even though when I got my offer from Colleen from Nojaji to publish, and I, I broke down, I, I broke down, I fainted, and I crawled up the stairs to him, and, oh, what is going to be published by Colleen? And you know, she said to me, you know, there are a few typos. <laughs> and I said, before we can go into typos, can you just be happy? So he's, he's that steady, solid, I know he loves me, he makes me jelly. But there is, there is a sense in which you come to believe in yourself and believe in the writing. And that's what the shift has been between pre-published and published. Because it's, it's actually out there in the world and it's, it's real. I, I'm still living in the world of wonder, so I'm not even going to ask the question about the next book. I think we need to read it. We need, we need to we need to keep wonder alive for a bit longer. I think. You know, I I, I, I didn't. The, the other thing is that, and I've said this to Alison often. You, I I will never write a first novel again. I'll never know what it was like not to write. I didn't know anything. I still don't know anything. But. And the husband again on New Year's Eve said, where's the second book, Lynn? And I registered for a PhD overnight and in the PhD program and I started writing on New Year's Day. But there are stories that will come and I don't think it's necessary to speak of them now because doing the marketing for the book and the, you know, all of that that can take years more, there's got to be the creative. I feel bereft without writing, which is really a pain to say. And I know, you know, there's a, when you give your book away to the publisher, there's a feeling of, Mm -hmm. There's a feeling of emptiness that's quite strong. It's almost a form of depression. 
Because what's it's there, it's gone. It's, it's been given, and then it goes into a kind of a dark room at the, at the distributors. Um, so, so there's, I'm still, and I've been told by a lot of people, stop doing it, it's enough now. It isn't enough now. It's, it's, it, it, where are these rules? There's the traditional publishing, and then there's this new world. It's not going on Amazon yet, I understand, because of international publication, and you can't muddy the waters and all of that. But she's more alive now than she was when I was writing her alone, but she's just being shared with more people. Mm -hmm. and, and the tone of the marketing, I mean, here are the guys today, probably through the Facebook connection, right? Is it, is it through Facebook? Yeah, but I know them through them for a long time now, so yeah. But basically the invitation came through on Facebook. And so, and so a lot of people say it's, it's, it's impersonal and it's redundant. It, it, it's making connections that you wouldn't make if you didn't have that at your disposal. Because if you'd be sitting in a bookshop at Bridge Books for a year during COVID, and I, I want you to buy the next half of these books here at 98 Commission Street, just around the corner from the Rand Track, please. Because, um, and in fact, I would like to ask, may I ask you, Mr. Bridge, hiding behind a chair, about how book sales have been during the pandemic? Can you do that? Can you just take can we get the pen and borrow it? Come yeah. on. No, yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. I, I just think you should appear, don't you? Ah, thank you. You ask him a question. And I'll ask him. Well, you ask him. Okay, then you give that to him. Sit in that chair for me. I, mean, oh, I just sorry. think that, that something about literacy and not literacy, and hold literary weariness. Look, he's got his mask on, everyone. And now you can take it off because you're in the mouth. I don't know, what's the state of, of the bookshop, of the book market, of reading in this last year? Um, I think on our side it was the actual book sales went back to normal from what we do walk in the shop. A lot of people have moved online. Mm -hmm. um, what was missing was the events. So it was all the events where you would sell a stack of books in one day. Mm -hmm. And before COVID, we would have two or three every week during the busy seasons. Um, and so to not have that is where it really pinched. So, and I think even though people were buying a lot of books, it also skewed towards cheap books because we have a lot of secondhand books as well. Okay. So I think secondhand bookstores did really well. Oh. Um, I haven't actually looked at how the other online stores have done. I don't know. Do you think there's more of a trend towards online books? Because you can get books delivered now, can't you? Real books. Yeah, I mean, we do that, but um, I find it's hard to curate online. Like, I think it's really good to find the book that everyone else is already reading, but to find the new book is really, really challenging because it's not, the metrics don't work for you. They're not working in your favor the way those, it's a, it's just a robot creating the pages. It's not a person curating most of those pages. So if you haven't already had sales or have a name that people are searching for, you don't end up on the top of that list. So. It's how do you gain that system? Do, do you, I'm turning the tables on you, but do you think that the marketing that's been done for this book has, has helped the book become more aware for you as a bookseller? Um, this is a question. <laughs> as a bookseller, I was going to say yes. I think for, I'm not sure how, I'm not I'm not sure how, actually how it goes, but I want this for my own book that we're doing for people ourselves. Mm -hmm. Is that like, mm -hmm. how do you get from the people who are looking at it to the next people? And I think the way the algorithms are set up is that when you post things and it's designed for only about 10% of your followers, so the people who are looking at you every, in theory, who would be seeing it actually see it. Because they want you to pay to get that wider audience. That's right. Um, so if you don't want to give Facebook a ton of your money, because we've already given them our lives, right? Like I feel like if they own my children's childhoods, you know, it's, they have a copyright on my little boys, you know. Wow. But um, if you don't want to do that, then you do have to post every day. You do have to post constantly. You do have to tag people and reiterate. And um, but it's a free flow. In other words, you have your own newspaper in a way. In a way, you are a publisher of your own. And I think that's what's hard for people is to acknowledge that if you're going to get into that, then you are becoming a small business in every way. And when we talk to self-published authors, that's the part of it often falls apart, is that you've, you've decided you're going to invest money to print this book, which means you don't have a business that you have to promote. No one's going to be able to do that for you. And we have a lot of authors that are like, hey, you could be putting us 
you know, in the window or on your newsletter or whatever. And just like, well, there's 5,000 books in here. They don't all fit, do they? I came and put one down the window when I came this morning. <laughs> but I think that pertains, sorry, Helen, to, 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 to take no. over, but I think that this pertains to um, published authors as well, I mean, traditionally published authors and self-published authors because no publication, no publishing house can take a book for months and months and months and do it. So well, and the space in traditional media has really shrunk. So look at the mm -hmm. when you were long the sitting in the Sunday Times. Was it in the Sunday Times? Did it appear in the newspaper? Bought the Sunday Times. It was, it was, was online. It was online. It only. was online. So for their own award, they did not have space to put mm -hmm. their own awards. Long does. And what does that say about the space that's available? Mm -hmm. Yes, there's an advertising crisis, mm -hmm. and that section would be supported by travel advertising or money. Mm -hmm. and since we don't have travel, mm -hmm. but that's the sports stores are still there. Right? So that's like where your books fit in. So if you don't create the space for yourself, no one's going to give it to you. And not only are you a, 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 a professional, if you like, or you have a new career, is that you also become a bit of an activist. Because I'm now connecting with authors all over the place. And I will not have racism in the literature. I just won't have it. And I can feel myself, I'm all worked up. You know, you, 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 you can't be an elderly white Jewish female in South Africa. Well, yes, I can. Um, but it's also interesting because I haven't written a book. The book is actually a satire of South African society through a Jewish prism through 2,000 years. If you are South African, you'll find little tiny reminders. But if you've lived in this country, you'll know prejudice, you'll know otherness, you'll know some kind of anti-racial and semitism and whatever. So we've got a lot of work to do. Can't think of things literally in the streets. Yeah. Which is also a good thing. Those men all go to Strabi, not Sunday lunch. Yeah. Okay, how, how long are we, to how long are we gonna, do, do you guys want to ask anything? How long have we been going? We, it's 12, 12, so we've been okay, going so for an hour. Okay, so we have 10 minutes. Thank, thank you. you. I just thought it was thank you, nice Lynn. to have a Thank you, thank you. Is there any, would you like me to, I can't dance, is there anything I can't do? She can sing. Well, you see, every chapter's got a song, then we can do an album, and then we say you're gonna do an album, we're gonna do another book. Um, I think that's another thing that comes to, to, to one, if I speak to women like Seth and Ash, is that everything that you, I don't know, everything that you do in your life, I mean, I've been a copywriter, I've been a cabaret singer, I've been a, um, a whole lot of things, I've been a traveler, I've been a wife, side, that at some point when you decide what, what it is that you're doing, it becomes like a, like a rope of your own experience that you can then use. So my performance abilities let me read the book. I had to work on the introvert. I was I, I was I was I was wandering around the garden when I started because I was going to be made the treasurer of the Reading Association of South Africa, something like that. And they'd come, someone had phoned me and said, would, you, "Would I stand?" And so I was sort of working my way towards the car, kind of just to pop in, just to see what was going to happen. And her and my husband saw me sort of skulking. He said, "What are you doing?" I said, "I'm just going to pop into Rada for a minute, Raz or whatever." And he said, "I'm sorry, I have to." What part of you writing a book do you not understand? And I said, you're right, FOMO has to leave the building. I'm not, what is my point of going there for an hour and a half to, to a role that I can't fulfill because the discipline that it took to become an introvert has taken me 60 years. The rest is kind of nice fluff and I can, I've done air guitar and boardroom tables. I've done some outrageous things in my advertising career and I might even do that here now. But it's it, it 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 I think experience I couldn't have written this book and as a younger and I know there are younger authors and they're brilliant. I just couldn't be brilliant because I just didn't know what, what I was writing about. I didn't know myself. Twenty one years of psychotherapy also has helped. It was my anniversary this week. Mm. Well done. <laughs> my therapist Thanks. is going to a therapist. <laughs> have any questions? Is there anything else that we can... Are there any questions on the FaceTime feed, or does that not work that way? It doesn't work that way. Can um, I ask a question? What would Wanda have to say about the Middle East right now? I mean, I've got a... <laughs> what would Wanda say about the Middle East right now? Mm. I would... That's a bitchy <laughs> question. Yeah. Wanda never wanted to go back to Eretz, okay? <coughs> so in the same chapter, I'm going to use my character, not myself. Mm -hmm. In the chapter that I just read about Sally the Sultan, she's captured by um, Grasa, who's the cousin, to take her back as a wife to Eretz, which is the land of Israel. 
because Sonny inherited a deal, because the Ottomans, remember, owned Israel for a certain amount of Palestine. Yes. And she and her thing was, I'm not going back to be a wife in Palestine, keeping the Shabbos, and, and I'm not going to be brought back in chains, basically. So the land of Israel as a historical homeland exists. Um, I'm going to plead the fifth on this and say she was she she does political deals. She did a political deal with um, for Zenobia, Queen of Palmyra, back in two seven two, when the males. I think it's a one of them. I think it's a little chauvinistic to be trying to be re-elected as a president and start a war with your neighbours. But I wouldn't quote her on that. <laughs> Um, I, th I think the Middle East, I think the fact that she came out of, I mean, she came out of Jerusalem, which was Palestine back then, and we're still fighting that now. I, I, I just think that keeping it in a literary space, if, if I would put Wanda now in a, in a story in Israel, I might, I, I'll have to think about it. I, it's a very challenging thought. Mm -hmm. But she doesn't really want to go back to Amos. You do have a question on the stream asking, mm -hmm. uh, is the next book going to be a sequel or a totally new book and direction I'm, I'm trying i'm trying to lose i'm trying to go i'm trying to move out of wonder and that, as i say in terms of the marketing of it could it be a sequel we let's just sell this book first so i'm actually what i'm writing about is a childhood experience that i want to turn into fiction i've also been invited by Nick Mishanga to contribute to a compilation of short stories south african short stories and because they're south african because it's South African, I'm looking very tentatively at writing the story. I came here at 14 as a little white Jewish girl. I knew nothing about apartheid, so I'm, I'm, I want to write about that experience, and then I have to uh, I have to consider how to write in, in the in the in the voice of the other, which is a black voice, and all of the PC that's going on at the moment. Mm -hmm. So I'm writing a whole. I'm right. I'm I'm, ex, I'm cutting out, as Salman Rushdie said, of the what usually is called a. Um, a writer's block, which isn't a writer's block, it's the experimental phase. And a lot of things, it's a mess, it's chaos. So um, it, it uh, there probably could be, I want to call it an integral because the 20th century isn't there. I didn't touch the Holocaust and I didn't touch South African politics. So there's, it, we could have an integral. It could be something that happens, you know, what happened to, what happened to her in the 20th century um, but, I'm, but I'm exploring how the voice of, I want to explore multiple perspectives. This book is written from Wanda's point of view. She's an unreliable narrator. She is, it's an autobiographical fiction. So I'm, I'm trying, I am attempting and succeeding to one degree or another of writing pieces that may form part of this Kali Shah, which is the voice of the feminine, from the time of Lilith to the time of Wanda and beyond. So it's experimental and because I'm doing the doctorate, I've been told by David Madali, just write. There's not, isn't even a brief, which is very scary. So that's what I'm doing. What else? Last question. Any curious about my life? Um, I'm always interested in, you, you've spoken a lot about lock, locking yourself in a room to write. I'm always interested in how different writers write, like when, and, you know, is it 4 a.m. that you write your best? Or have, have you learned that about your, your writing style? So I've got a thing about a room of my own, um, which I never had until I started doing this MA. There was no place I could go to, shut the door, put it on the table, and it would be left there. I always had to clean up because we shared a studio. And I eventually found a nook in the front of my house and an owl desk. It was a very sort of um, was superstitious. Like, I need this desk. It's, it's, I dreamt of this desk. And what I found, and any author will tell you through history, because I read a lot, I'm also fascinated by how did they do it. You get up, you sit at the desk, and you write with my thing. If I, if I go for a cup of tea, it's fine. But if I do exercise, which I don't do anymore, or if I write an email for business, you've got, I've got to go straight from my unconscious mind to the table. I like to think of it as 6 a.m., but it very seldom is. But before I do anything else, so I run a business. I then gave my staff, um, we started at 9 instead of 8, so that I could say that I would go to the office after. So for me, if I do any, I, I used to be a night owl a lot, and now I'm a morning owl, but 6 a.m. is a stretch for me. I think if, if, if and also it's a word count thing, ish, is like, right, um, it's called a conrad, it's a name after Joseph Conrad. Joseph Conrad wrote 800 words a day, cleaned them up and moved on, cleaned them up and moved on. 
and then eventually, so does Stephen King, he writes a thousand words a day, cleans them up and lives on. So if you do that for 50 days, you'll have 50,000 words. A defining writer says they sit every day, but the, um, Murakami says he does it, and he swims a million miles, and he said, I like to mesmerize myself into the meditative mind. So you kind of, it's like a place where you pick it up the next day, it's very idealistic. But sit down, in fact, just to quote Ivan Vladislavich to end, when we had a very brilliant girl, woman, in our MA class who you could see, she, the night before she wrote a couple of thousand words, they were brilliant, a hundred words, brilliant, brilliant. And so someone said, why do you not write more, or why, how, what's your writing thing? And she said, well, when she's inspired, she sits down at the desk. But when she's inspired, she only writes when she's inspired. And he said, I hope when you, when you, when, I hope you're sitting at the desk when you're inspired. There's something to that. In other words, the inspiration is one thing, but discipline mm -hmm. is something I never, I never knew what discipline it would take, even though I'm disciplined. So morning, room of my own, coffee provided, don't speak to me. Don't speak, which he loves. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's, that's, a, I try, I try by all means, but I, it, it took me a long time between publishing this and sitting down again to get to that desk again. It's still, it's still the terror. And don't get it. distracted by social media. Switch it. Oh. <laughs> so you can have the internet on for research, because that helps, but don't answer a thing. It, it, it's, you know, go into airplane mode. Yeah. But you, you can't have, you, you've got to actually mesmerize, I think Murakami's thing is to mesmerize yourself into the story and um, old Uncle Ernest Hemingway says you must stop when you know what's going to happen next. So you've just got a little bit to look forward to, so that you've just got that little click in, and even if it's a sentence. Mm -hmm. uh, there are a lot of the, ans the ancestors of, 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 who are mainly male, because women only started writing books 100 years ago, apart from the Brontes. I mean, if you look at the, at, the, at the literary canon, but, you know, women were raising babies and mm. killing Jesus and doing all that sort of thing, so it took a while for them to, to come to the desk. Thanks for asking. There's one more question on here asking, do you think you'd ever be able to write from a male perspective? I have. Thanks for asking. Uh, it's a very interesting... Let's well, repeat the question. Okay, so the question was, can I write from a male's point of view? Um, so I'm going to give you the teaser quickly because we're closing. In 1968, on the 24th of June, a comedian called Tony Hancock committed suicide in our home. Mm -hmm. I was nine. I was the one who nearly found him. It's, it's haunted and tormented me for 50 years. My father wrote a book. My father's now dead. He wrote his story. So I've been wanting to write the story of the nine-year-old's perspective, which is a girl. And then I came up with my opening sentence, which I'm not going to tell you here, because someone might steal it. And then I started writing in the voice of a dead comedian. He's not a Jew. He's dead. I, I think you can't, I can't, I don't know if I, it will be contextualized because I don't know if I, you can't defend the dead and all. But I found a male voice who is completely unique to me. He's not Wanda. He's not me. And he's talking to me now and I'm taking him. In fact, he's got to be British. He's very cynical. He's, he's a bastard of a person. He's, he, he, he died for reasons that I can explore. So my, my, my politically correct question is, if I have a conversation with an illiterate domestic servant from the 70s, am I allowed to speak in her voice? I am allowed to, but I might be restricting myself because of, and how I'm doing that is, when Samuel Beckett wrote, wrote Waiting for Godot, this might sound pretentious as hell, when Samuel, Godot, when Samuel wrote Waiting for Godot, he wrote it in French, which was not his mother tongue. So he wrote it in pidgin French, if you want to call it that. So I want to create the, the, the other character in almost a way, because I, I do do mother tongue languages for a living, but I don't speak them fluently. So I'm, I'm very interested in the otherness. So yes, I, I can write as a man, I can write as a dog. My dog, Yoko, could tell you a story. In fact, maybe she should. I think she should. I think one is entitled as a writer to write what one one's truth, one's own version of it, one's own alternative facts. So Tony Hancock's coming back to life in my brain, but I still have to find a fake name for him. And that's, that's what's, and so now the dead comedian is, just, is narrating the story. And he's no wonder. Oh, <laughs> I'm so glad you said that. Well, thank you very much for making the effort to be here thank and you. to be such an engaging 
audience and we hope that you enjoy reading Wonder. Well, and please stay in touch with me because I love to engage. Yes, no, it's very, very good. Right. Thank you. And thank you to Bridgebox. Thank you, Griffin. Thank you, thank you Griffin. Wonderful. Thank you.